Welcome to Press Play, the Street Cred podcast with Elena Krasdow, yours truly, and Jimmy Moak from Street Cred PR. In this podcast, Jimmy and I will welcome industry leaders, journalists, influencers, and friends of the firm to shed some light on who they are and the various twists and turns that led them to where they are today. We're grateful to have you listening in, and we hope you enjoy the show. My name is Elena Kratznow. Welcome to Press Play, the Street Cred Podcast. I'm so grateful you're here. I'm the editorial manager and client brand evangelist at Street Cred PR and your host for today's show, along with co-host and managing partner, Jimmy Moak. We will break down the show into two segments, press where we dive into all the hard news about our guest life and their professional goals, and then play where we have a little extra fun with it. Today, we are delighted to be joined by the director of WealthStack Content and Solutions at Informa Connect, Shannon Rossick. To give our listeners a little more background on Shannon, she is an exceptionally talented and motivated marketing specialist with over eight years of relevant and proven experience creating effective B2B digital content campaigns. She also brings extensive experience in video production, podcasting, project management, social media, and event planning. As the director of WellStack Content and Solutions at Informa Connect, the parent company of well-established industry media platform, wealthmanagement.com, Shannon supports and drives the omnichannel growth and development of WealthStack, a fast-growing event dedicated to technology in the wealth management industry and a component of Wealth Management Edge. She also serves as the market-facing representative for the group and regularly hosts the WealthStack podcast in addition to frequent webinars and other special video series. You can see Shannon on stage and on the ground at all your favorite industry events, including Nitrogen's Fearless Investing Summit, Future Proof, Orion Ascent, Market Council, WealthStack, of course, and more. Outside of work, she can be found barrel racing at local rodeos, hiking with her two dogs, and skiing the slopes of Colorado. Shannon, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I need to have you do my intros for everything in life. <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you. I would be so honored. <laughs> You're amazing. She, she'll also um, do a voicemail recording for your cell phone if if you need that. So. That's true. It is a service that I can offer to you. <laughs> oh, okay. New, new side hustles cropping up everywhere. Love to hear it. That's right. Voicemail recordings are coming back with a force. <laughs> Shannon, well, don't, how don't are call you? Me. I was going to say, I'm great. I was going to say, don't ever call me though, because I don't. I know that after market am, council. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm one of those millennials. If I see a number pop up, I'm like, yeah, that's going to voicemail. Sorry. A hundred percent. Text me or email me. <laughs> Unless I have your number saved in my phone, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it better be urgent. Like I even get stressed out when my parents call me. I'm like, something went wrong. Clearly <laughs> something's Same. happening. <laughs> Same. Our generation is just blessed with this phone anxiety. I'm not sure why. <laughs> How about you, Jimmy? <laughs> I actually love to answer calls from the quote unquote potential spam. Ooh. and have long-winded conversations with whoever's calling. Sometimes it's a recording and like a AI prompt that I'm talking to, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, but, hey, Jimmy actually takes. also gives great responses to our auto emails that we get that everyone else just says unsubscribe to. But Jimmy will give thoughtful responses to those emails, which leave our team cracking up laughing. <laughs> Well, I will say Jimmy is a funny guy. I've known him for years. He never ceases to make me laugh. So <laughs> absolutely <laughs> true. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We are absolutely thrilled to have you. Uh, before we dive into the story of how you became the brilliant marketing specialist that you are now, we always start off the show with, with a super important question, which is, what did you have for lunch today or breakfast, depending on where you're at? I was going to say it's 9 a.m. here in Denver, uh, so <laughs> I still haven't even had coffee, let alone thought about what I'm having for lunch today. And anyone that knows me knows I am not a morning person, so you both are really special. <laughs> for I feel on. really special <laughs> with me, but uh, actually I, I'm looking forward to lunch today, though, because I have a client meeting and those are always fun when you get to get out of the house and go eat somewhere fun. So while oh, I, I haven't had that. lunch yet, I am looking forward to it today. <laughs> All right. You got to give us some type of answer. What did you have for lunch yesterday? Oh, gosh. it's It's been a leftover week because I have preparing for, you know, Christmas meals and all of that. So it was leftover, you know, casserole, chicken okay. and rice casserole that I had made for us to munch on throughout the week. Because if I didn't cook in our household, we would starve. And I, <laughs> God bless. I love my parents to death. But 
Yeah, they they are very much eat to survive kind of people. <laughs> and so it's up to me to do the majority of the cooking if we want to survive or have flavor. <laughs> I was so, just go ahead, Jimmy. So did you you traveled home already? Is that the deal or so I well, being an only child, every stereotype is true. My parents followed me out to Colorado actually a few years ago after I moved out here with my husband. So they wow. are 30 minutes down the road. So it does make the holidays a bit easier. I love That's that. very cool. No, I was just talking to a friend yesterday about how this week before you travel for the holidays is all about just scrounging what's in your pantry and your fridge mm -hmm. and not going grocery shopping. So I support the living on rice casserole all week until the finish line. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's getting a little scary at this point, but I don't care. <laughs> Power through the good so stuff relate. is coming. <laughs> yep, <And> exactly. <laughs> one added bonus on this point. When you go to your client uh, meeting today, you'll have a great icebreaker That's as right. you guys are looking over the menu, right? <laughs> That is That's great. right. Thank you for We've that. We've set I you up well for later <laughs> oh, as man, a reward for waking for up early with us. Yes. <laughs> love it. Love All it. All right. Let's get into it, Shannon. To start off, tell our listeners a little bit about how you got to where you are today. What drew you to marketing and wealth management? And how did you find yourself positioned as such a visible face on Informa's team? Oh, boy. Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> so, About 30 to 45 minutes. <laughs> fantastic. All right. I'll try to keep it within there. I'm actually very fortunate to be where I am today. And I honestly couldn't have done it without the support and mentorship of industry friends and colleagues over the year. And look, I had zero intention of going into finance. I was a mass comm major in college with a background in film and journalism and broadcasting. So caveat, I will say my parents are super excited that my degree has actually been put to good use over the last <laughs> few years. But, you know, outside of not even having an interest or knowing much about finance, let alone financial media, it just so happened that my first job out of college, I was an account coordinator at an email deliverability company, <laughs> and it quickly solidified what I already knew about myself, which is I am not a technical person. I'm not a numbers person. It's extremely analytical. You both know me. I'm a creative. And so actually, I started helping out the marketing team after getting my account coordinator duties done. And shadowing them, asking questions. I started doing things like ghostwriting articles, helping out with their e-newsletters. And that eventually escalated into me applying to a marketing coordinator role at Investment News. And God bless them for taking a chance on me. Because that is where I got to learn from people like Matt Ackerman, Suzanne Syracuse, and Mark Bruno. And that's where I found my love for wealth tech and this space in general. And as you all know, my love of digital media. And I'm sure you remember the gadget girl days. You know, I started. <laughs> so. I, yeah, Elena and I were talking and I told Elena as we were prepping for this show, at some point, gadget girl is going to come up. But I don't know where. <laughs> Uh, but I was supposed yes. to ask about it, not not have you offer. You it up stole to his us. thunder, Shannon. He's very oh, upset. Oh no, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. But it, it's, let me it's... let me just say, <laughs> fortunate indeed. I mean, to come into this industry with with Suzanne Syracuse, Mark Bruno, and Matt Ackerman, plus the journalists that were all at Investment News at the time. Oh yeah. I mean, count your lucky stars. Well, exactly. And I started out as just a little marketing coordinator, helping out with events, you know, emails and everything that goes into a marketing coordinator role. And then I quickly attached myself to Matt Ackerman, whether he liked it or not, because that's where I fell in love with all things video. And that's where Gadget Girl came about, our crazy viral video series. Where love it. Still to this day, I describe it as Inspector Gadget meets Carmen Sandiego for Wealth exactly Tech. Exactly where my <laughs> mind went, except maybe with a little Kim Possible thrown in too. Ooh, ooh, I like that. And of course, in my favorite color being purple, I had the purple trench coat for Dora, I've got to find a way to resurrect that personality. I mean, it might be like gadget grandma at this point, but either way, <laughs> uh, th th it, that's really what solidified my my love of storytelling, especially within this space. And so, you know, after Investment News, I was there for almost five years. Wonderful experience. That was really my springboard. Uh, I did a stint over at Asset TV, again, being the market facing representative for fintech and then i had this crazy idea that i was going to basically be a 
mini entrepreneur and my colleague and I left in, uh, Asset TV and launched an entire media arm for a company called Medici, which has since been acquired by Prove. But we said, hey, take a chance on us. We'll launch your entire video arm. And that took me all over the world to cover fintech, which was just staggering and an incredible experience and took me even beyond wealth management. So banking, lending, payments, payments. Name it, yeah, yeah. yeah, all yeah. of that. And so I was very fortunate to uh, get to see that side of things as well. After that, came back into the business and held some marketing roles at some wealth tech firms. I was at Robust Wealth and then ran marketing for Flyer Financial Technologies. And then my good friend, Mark Bruno, called me up and said, would you like to come work for me again at Informa? And I, of course, jumped at the chance to work with him and folks that I had worked with in the past as well. So I already knew what I was getting into. So it feels like a bit of a homecoming being back on the media side of things. And and I love it. I've been here a little over a year now already. It's it's flown, but extremely blessed to not only be the market facing representative for all things well stack. I get to do the podcasting. I get to do the webinars. I get to be on video. I get to be out on the road speaking and spending time with industry friends like yourselves. So I'm I'm very fortunate. And like I said, it's not anything I had ever pictured in my mind growing up. <laughs> but but here we are and it has absolutely worked out. And uh, I'm just very, very lucky. I so love cool. hearing that whole story. Um, and I love <laughs> that my story <laughs> keeps coming up too, because I, when I was with him at Market Council, which you were also at, and you did a phenomenal job on stage at oh, Market Council you. also, we were talking about podcasting for like an hour. So I love that he keeps coming up. But you just alluded to this, Shannon, the role you have has so many different functions. So from what I understand, and based on what you just shared, you kind of sit in this gray area between journalist, marketer, video content wizard, professional speaker. Tell us a little bit more about how you approach these different responsibilities and how you find the synergies between all of them. And also please try to, or please share with us and our audience how you also find time for karaoke. (laughs) Oh boy. Okay. Well, I've I've been really lucky that a lot of my roles have been tailored to my skill set. And like you said, I sit between this hybrid world of marketing and content production with a sprinkle of journalism and sales enablement. And so, you know, the sales or the sales stuff is something that I am not naturally good at. I had no idea I learned from the school of Matt Ackerman, thank goodness. And so that has been a muscle that I've had to train, if you will, because I am a creative at heart. That's what comes naturally to me. And I'm sure working with me can sometimes feel like nailing jello to a wall because I want to try so many things at once. But because I do get to live in that gray area, there are those natural synergies between them all. Um, And like I said, I've had to strengthen that analytical and critical thinking muscle over the years. Uh, And while content creation is fun and exciting, I obviously still need to prove the value behind it, understand ROI, dig into the numbers behind things. And so, you know, having both media roles and marketing roles has really helped me hone those skills. So like I said, I've been very lucky that I've been able to sit on both sides of the aisle because I've gotten handed marketing budgets and said, here, you decide what the directive is, what conferences we should be at, what campaigns we should be running, where should we be investing our marketing dollars? And that was something that I hadn't done before, dove in, really enjoyed it, uh, and got to drive the whole vision for the marketing program. But like I said, I'm a creative at the end of the day. I love coming up with new ideas. And storytelling is just one of my favorite things to do. And so that's where that marketing and journalism and broadcast side of me really gets to shine because that's just what comes naturally and what I love to do and really where I focus a lot of my time. And being an extrovert, (laughs) to your point, (laughs) Jimmy, a lot of you have seen me on the road and I apologize in advance if you've had had to listen to me do karaoke. But there have been a a couple events this year where uh, Matt Ackerman and I got handed the mic and an hour Mm -hmm. later we are sweating and (laughs) I can't breathe because I don't know when to take a breath when you're rapping Eminem still. So I'm working on that, but (laughs) I'm not going to lie we practiced for our market council (laughs) performance. We had decided our song ahead of time. Mac even came in with his Mr. Worldwide Pitbull linen suit and sunglasses. And I was Kesha because we sang Timber. And so it's, it's, you know, when you're on the road, it's important to have fun too. And people always say, Oh, when you travel, it must be a, must be really nice, must be a luxury. And I always say, 
yes, it's, it's certainly a perk, but I almost work double or harder when I'm on the road because not only do you have to be on, whether it's doing video and speaking, but you also have to keep up with your day job. So, (laughs) so you, you both know how it is. You're both on the road all the time. So you just have to have fun when you're on the road too. So when opportunities come up like karaoke, I am jumping on it. You can, you can find me on the mic. (laughs) Tons of follow-ups. Can I go or do you want to go, go first? Elena? Go, go, go. Really love how you positioned where you are today with your career and the fact that you were on the marketing side, deciding how to break through the clutter and gain mind share at the fintechs. And now you're on the other side approaching your former self, more or less, I got to imagine that that gives you a really solid uh, competitive advantage probably isn't the right word, but but you're you know who you are talking to because you sat in that seat. It's it certainly helps. And a lot of folks do come to me to pick my brain about that. So, like I said, I am very fortunate that I have been able to sit on both sides of things. Totally. And and yeah, I I, I can't complain because it's that's one of my favorite parts of my jobs is is that and that's the question that I ask to everyone I work with is what are your goals and what can I help you with and again that's where I talk about the the sales side of things while I'm not a sales person by any means all I'm trying to learn is how we can ultimately help you and how storytelling can help you and how getting your brand out there and what your goals are for the year so yeah, I again, it's it's just been a wild trajectory and I am just I'm grateful for all the firms that have taken a chance that have handed me the keys to the kingdom in some cases and and let me run with it. I I always say I struggle a little bit with imposter syndrome because I'm like I, I sure I maybe I'm exactly where I should be but sometimes like you said Jimmy it's it's almost that weird almost double look in the mirror, <laughs> looking back at myself, just like you said, sitting mm-hmm. on both sides of things. It's just been, it's been a fun, it's been a fun ride and never yeah. thought it would be in wealth management because <laughs> look, I, I love our industry and it's small and, and what keeps me in it is the people, but I didn't know the first thing about it. When you hear wealth management, yeah, that's dry, stuffy finance stuff, but oh my God. Goodness, was I proven wrong? <laughs> well, I don't see a single imposter here for what it's worth, <laughs> especially given the career that you just laid out, Shannon. You are absolutely the real deal. And oh, I love what you were talking about, about how you show up at conferences, because from everything I've seen, that's so true. You really embody, I think, what it means to show up at a conference with your full self, both on stage, on the ground, at the karaoke mic, like you are embracing the entire experience to the fullest. And I think it's an example that everyone can follow. Well, and you want to get the most out of it when you're on the ground, right? You're you're there to not only learn, but you're there to network. And I'm just genuinely interested in what people have to say and what their stories are. Yeah. That's that's what fills my tank on at the end of the day. When I'm on the road, even though you're exhausted, you've been traveling, you've probably gotten two, three hours of sleep and you're just running on fumes. I I say I run on tequila and adrenaline and questionable decisions when I'm <laughs> when I'm, at, when I'm at these conferences. But but it really that's truly what gets me going and, and fills me is just getting to talk to folks and being out in front of them. And I, my poor husband, I always joke and say he gets the worst version of me because on the road, I'm my extroverted self. I'm on relatively best behavior and <laughs> ev- and everyone's getting the best version of me. And then I come home and it's sweatpants and depleted cream <laughs> and like a messy bun and don't touch me. Don't look at me like I, I can't <laughs> for three days because I've been, you know, talking to a hundred people all week. So <laughs> It's it's I'm still working on that balance a little bit. Can relate. I, I love it. With with people in my life, it's like, oh my God, do I really have to talk to you? I have spent my entire day talking to clients, talking to media, talking to the team. <laughs> right. I just want to shut the hell up for the rest of the day. But take a vow whoever, of whoever that other person is, you know, probably hasn't had as many conversations as I have. So they they're they're looking forward to engaging, mm-hmm. and it's the last thing I want to do. <laughs> so, real quick, Yakatori boy, the party that we threw with Summit and intentionally, uh-huh. you show up, 
and you find Matt Ackerman and you guys went into one of the karaoke rooms and mm-hmm. then you never came back out. No. It, was just, it was literally <laughs> you and Matt in there singing to each other for mm-hmm. the longest time. Now, other people came in and out, but you guys were just happy to be there singing to each other. <laughs> And is Gosh. that is that the practice session or how the hell did you guys practice for karaoke <laughs> with him in New Jersey and you in Colorado? You got to oh. you got to you got to give us a scoop there. So I'm not going to lie. There were a lot of texts flying back and forth that we were both practicing in our cars. So we would we would turn on Timber when we were practicing for market council and say, hey, I'm practicing my part. And we would just go back and forth and talk about even little choreography when they say spin your partner round and round there is video proof of all of this Jenny. <laughs> so I, w- I will say but that's how matt and i have always been though and that's been our relationship since day one and that's why he's i consider him one of my best friends even outside of the industry i mean he was at my wedding you know matt has always been just my go-to to bounce crazy ideas off of but we also have that brother sister relationship where we can just have fun like that we fight like family we love like family it's all it's all those things and you know karaoke is something that also just fits our personalities matt actually has a really good voice and gets really into it he Um, does i was impressed yeah he's amazing and so honestly we've just done it over the years together i've gotten a little braver with it he will always take a microphone i've seen that man take over random karaoke stages at bars and just say you're you're done here (laughs) and then (laughs) and then work the room work the crowd and so you know (laughs) learn from the best and and again it's just it's about having fun too. Totally. At the end, at the end of the day, you, you got to have an outlet <laughs> somehow. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. You, you both know Matt and I love being in front of a camera or on a mic. And so if you hand us one, yes. something's probably going to happen. Bound to happen. Love it. Um, well, as we've been talking about, you are a regular conference goer. We see you out at all the best industry events with a mic in your hand, whether on stage or at the karaoke dance floor. But from your experience, tell us a little bit about what you think makes an event really successful, both from the planning perspective and the perspective as an attendee. Regular conference goer, you make it sound like a bad habit. (laughs) <laughs> no, but in all honesty absolutely not <laughs> i will say getting to attend events is probably my second favorite part of my job first being you know obviously getting to do video and all the content stuff that i love but like i said it's it's just what fills my tank and makes me energized when i'm on the road is getting to see people and like i said i really just enjoy talking to folks hearing their stories hearing what makes them well them and uh, understanding how I can ultimately help them tell their story, but events as a whole. And as you know, at Informa, we are adding to the growing number of events in our space between the wealthies and wealth management edge, which we're planning for right now. For me, it's the networking opportunities. It's having various topics and perspectives on an agenda and interactive activities. Mm. If you're going to take time away from the office or your business, you better be getting some value out of it, which is why it's so encouraging to see so many events lean heavily into experience-based initiatives. I know that's something we're doing at Informa, or even take a look at Future Proof, for example, with their breakthrough meetings. That place sounded like a dang beehive. It was incredible. Totally. And so if there's opportunities like that or, or opportunities to create content while on site, you know, we have have podcasting rows at edge, you know, video opportunities, headshots, anything like that, that can help create value, I think is extremely important to conferences. So you kind of have to have a little bit of, of everything because everyone's priorities might be a little bit different at, at an event. So you certainly need to cater to all of that. So at a high level, it's the networking, it's the content, and it's just the overall experience. And I'm not going to say food because it, that's just a hard one. <laughs> that events that do yeah, have well everyone seems to struggle with just keep people caffeinated make sure you have coffee that's my biggest thing if you take away coffee too soon or don't have it what are you doing <laughs> yeah it should be out all day, all day. every every day i don't yep. care and, if it's watered down and terrible like it needs right. to be out <laughs> and like and stop spending money on the crazy expensive coffee makers where there's yeah. a line of people waiting for their lattes or cappuccinos like there, yeah, all right, fine. There's a spot for that. And I can realize that there's sponsorship dollars tied to those. And that's all yep. great. But 
what about just regular coffee that I can go and fill up my cup and be back to whatever I was doing in under 30 seconds? Exactly. <laughs> and I don't want to have to walk 10 miles through a convention center to get right. it either. Absolutely. Now I'm just complaining, but yeah. <laughs> it is a point of contention for a lot of folks. <laughs> it is. It is. Well, and that's the kind of stuff that people remember, unfortunately, even though, even if the content is amazing, if you're not caffeinated <laughs> enough to appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. That's going to be a problem, but yeah. it's part of the experience, right? Absolutely. I, I mean, there's one event this year. I'm not going to name it since it's one we all know. I mean, we were basically holding these poor conference people hostage until they got fresh coffee out. We like cornered them <laughs> and waited for them to roll out the new like, new tubs and crafts of, of coffee. <laughs> there was an insurgency. It. Yes. So there was about to be a bit of an uprising <laughs> because oh there was gosh. coffee available at 9 a.m. in the exhibit hall. <laughs> was I at that show? You might have been. I don't know. There, there was one where I went through the same thing this year. See? So oh I was just God. wondering. Again, yeah. the things the things you remember. I'm exactly. Like, we probably all went to what collectively 15 to 20 conferences, but we remember our poor coffee. That's experience. right. That's right. right. <laughs> okay. So experience-based opportunities to create content, get value for your business, and for the love of God, please have coffee. Yeah. Those are the takeaways. Pretty much. <laughs> I make it sound so simple. I love it. It's an easy <laughs> formula. Um, oh, wait, okay. so I have one quick follow-up. Yeah. I, I hope it's a quick one. Um, <laughs> in your role now, mm -hmm. what do you like better? Is it Ooh. the preparing for an event, especially one that you're throwing, or is it actually living in it and the event is happening and going on and you're running around like a, like a mad woman orchestrating <laughs> everything? Uh, okay. I will try to give a somewhat PC answer because there are pros and cons to both. So we are in the throes of planning right now. Edge, as you all know, it's about a 2000 person conference, multiple days. It's huge. We have over 200 speakers, over a hundred sponsors. It is a heavy lift and we have teams upon teams that, that work on this. And my direct involvement with that is helping plan and write the whole agenda for the Wellstack track. I am helping curate speakers. I'm helping the sales team with sponsorship ideas. I'm working on think tanks. So there's a lot that goes into the back end that people don't see in the ugly side of things and the late nights and the stress. <laughs> and the even when I'm at home, again, my poor husband, he just knows about the two months leading up to edge, like don't poke the bear because I am just in it. You're going through all the prep calls. You're making sure everything's in place. But honestly, getting to start and coming up with the ideas and the themes and the concepts, that part I love. And, you know, going into Edge 2024, we have a heavy emphasis on AI on the tech side of things. We have some fun topics. You know, one thing that we do really well on Informa is, is content, but almost to the point where we compete with ourselves. So we even realized this last year's event while we we crushed it with content, we almost had too much. So, mm. and we, and that was also some feedback that we had from a lot of folks is you had this track, you know, session going on on this track for Wellstack, but then you had this session going on for RA Edge. I couldn't competing. be in two places at once. Right. And so we're like, well, why are we doing this to ourselves? And so we made a very concerted effort this year to make sure that that wasn't going to be the case. We are leaning much more into the experience side of things. Like I mentioned, curating time for more networking. We'll, we'll have dedicated roundtables this year for smaller groups that want to go deeper on specific topics. I'm going to be hosting tech tours where experts in the industry are going to take groups of advisors around to, you know, through the exhibit hall and do some speed dating <laughs> with the sponsors and exhibitors. So there's a lot of cool stuff that we're going to be doing this year. And getting to plan all that is fun, but sometimes when you're in it, it is hard to look outside of your bubble and realize there's other things going on. <laughs> so I'm still mm -hmm. learning to strike that balance, but I love that aspect of it. <clears throat> it obviously comes with its challenges. You're hitting your deadlines. You have your numbers you need to hit, all of that. But honestly, I learned my lesson last year because I tried to do a little too much at Edge. I was chairing Wellstack. I was doing video interviews. I was moderating sessions. I was running between stages. And I barely even got a chance to go in our own exhibit hall. And so lesson learned from, from this past year, because I love when I'm in it. I, Like I said, I run on the adrenaline when I'm at these things. And if you saw me at Edge, I was 
flying around everywhere, sprinting in heels. I looked like an absolute <laughs> maniac, but I love hummingbird mode. Oh, mm. oh, thank you. I'm totally stealing that. Yes. Hummingbird mode. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> I literally would get off stage, sprint to go do a video interview and then have a meeting with somebody sprint back on stage. And so I'm going to do a better job with my, my schedule <laughs> this year to make sure I actually have time to enjoy the things that we've put together. Because again, I, I want, I want, feedback on site, how people are enjoying it. I want to experience all the things that we put together that we put so much hard work in for months and months. I didn't get to really see any of it. So I want to do a better job of that this year. But honestly, being in it and seeing it all come together and getting to breathe a sigh of relief that, ha, ah, we, we pulled it yes. off. It's happening. <laughs> things are going well. You know, it's one of those things I know you guys know at events too, that you try to shield folks from all the crazy that goes on behind the scenes. You should see the WhatsApp groups <laughs> when we're on site <laughs> at Edge and the messages that are flying, but no one's ever going to know that those things are happening <laughs> behind the scenes. But, you know, internally you're panicking, but you're still smiling and nodding at the same time and you get through it. <laughs> but, it, you know, I've been in on the event side of things on and off over the last almost 10 years now, you know, from investment news when we used to do the retirement income summit, the women advisor summits, and now at edge at such a large scale, the event planning is always fun, but gosh, dang it, is it stressful? <laughs> and you need a lot of people uh, involved to, to pull it off. So shout out absolutely to our events team, because okay. it, it truly takes a village to pull off something that ginormous. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love to hear that you're leaning more into the experience-based model. I think it can be underestimated how valuable it is to just have breathing room in between things. Yes. And there's always that urge to fill up the space with something amazing. But that breathing room can really lead to something organically beautiful for people and be something they take away from the experience they actually really enjoyed. And then you can prioritize the content that is the absolute best of the best. Exactly. So I love that strategy. I think it's going to work out great. Can't wait to see what y'all put together for Edge this year and hope the planning doesn't keep you too on edge, so to speak. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, uh, ooh. Okay, okay. <laughs> but that's awesome. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, I'm going to pivot us. Because I would be remiss if we didn't talk about public relations just of a course. little bit while we have you here. <laughs> um, so yeah, how do you think PR agencies can best support people who exist on the marketing side of journalistic publications? And what do you think from your experience makes for a strong PR partner? Absolutely. And I've had the privilege of working with several of the PR firms in our industry, and including uh, Street Cred, and you guys are just fantastic. And I have always found PR firms incredibly valuable. Uh, it's almost like an extension of your team. And for me, as somebody, like you said, that kind of sits on that marketing side of a you know, journalistic publication, to work with us, it's it's just about creating that relationship, right? And that's what I always tell folks who are trying to get in front of the media. Come to us, build that relationship, you know, put your clients in front of us, have those ideas. I mean, you guys know me. If you come to me with a creative idea or, or with a client that says they want to do something different, I'm just happy to brainstorm and spitball those ideas. But, you know, just offering up those clients who align with our initiatives and knowing that we can help. I would say the biggest thing to to ensure that you do have a strong relationship with your PR partner is really making sure that the firm just aligns with the company culture and they truly understand the business. That's the biggest thing for me. Whenever I've worked with marketing firms, when I've been in my, my marketing roles or running marketing departments, the biggest thing for me is do you truly understand the business and how are you going to help us achieve these initiatives, right? I'm, I'm looking to the PR firm to obviously create buzz around a certain product, a certain concept, uh, certain messaging that we were trying to get out at that particular time. You know, I, in the past, maybe I've even worked with firms that, you know, something as simple as helping us create social posts and getting earned media quotes, the, all of that adds up over time, right? And so it's just finding those opportunities and making sure that that firm truly understands what you're trying to accomplish because you don't want a PR firm to come in and say, hey, here's our here's our template. Here's something that's standard that we do across the board for all of our clients and check the boxes. You'll get three quotes this month and, you know, these publications and, and Godspeed. Like that's not what you're <laughs> what we're looking for, right? <laughs> so, and I'm sure you all have horror stories <laughs> from, from the industry, but it's just so important for, for that partner just to truly understand 
uh, your your messaging, your products, and and what you're ultimately trying to accomplish. And you know, it's funny. I, I have a lot of wealth tech firms that come to me and say, "Hey, you know, do do I need to get on board with a PR firm? Do I need to hire someone?" And I always say, "Look." PR is amazing. It's great. It can do a lot for you, but it has to make sense for your business at the time, right? You don't want to hire a PR firm just to have one because that's not going to help them and then they can't be successful to help you. And so if it makes sense, if you're at that point where you say marketing's in a good place, my business model's in a good place, but I need a little bit more, I need that help, I need that extension, then you know that it's time to bring in a PR firm. Because I'm sure you know you've probably brought on clients and maybe they weren't totally prepared or ready or understood what it meant to work with a PR firm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say this year we've probably turned away four or five prospects telling them you're, you're not ready yet. You know, go nail your, your marketing agency, Mm -hmm. you know, make sure or fill the internal marketing role that you have vacant and keep chugging along. And then, come talk to us. And I think they appreciate that. I, I know I would. If I, was going I, were, to say, I would if too. I were an entrepreneur in, in the land of fintech or, or running an RIA, and you hit on something else that I think is very, very important. It's a very, while we are a small industry and there's a lot of companies fighting for precious real estate on the editorial side of things, you can't fake it until you make it here. I mean, if no, you are if you are a marketing firm or a PR firm that does not understand the industry, you're toast. And I love to go head to head with <laughs> firms like that. Let me tell I know you, you do. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it's so important. It's such yeah. a it's such a, a difference. If you can come in and say, like you said, I understand this space. Explain to me, you know, what you're trying to accomplish. Explain your product, and that firm is wants to actually get to know and go deep, that makes the world of difference. Because again, I'm not trying to go out and just have a couple quotes, random quotes that don't necessarily in in some articles that don't align with my overarching initiatives. That's, that's not what PR is. That's not what it's meant for. And to harness the power of it, you've got to have a strategy and a plan behind it and align with your partner. So it's actually encouraging to hear that you've turned folks away. I mean, obviously, from a business standpoint, I get it, but that's just going to be a headache for you at the end of the day, because Mm -hmm. that client's not going to be a fit. So don't even bother. So I I appreciate hearing that you actually tell folks, Hey, you're, you're not ready yet. Cause I know not not everyone does that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. If the prospective client, you know, doesn't have their messaging in order in-house, it's very hard for us to then take that and articulate it to their key audiences in a way that's going to really elevate their business. So there is definitely a moment where PR comes in and can really shine and do its best work. And if it comes in too early, that can be a little bit difficult. Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, this whole conversation has felt like play. It's been so much fun to have you on, Shannon. Um, But I'm going to officially take us into our play segment. And our first question is, if it weren't marketing and financial services, what would you be doing? Well, again, (laughs) I keep telling everyone I want my legacy to be known as the weird horse girl because that (laughs) is what I am passionate about. I have been riding horses since I was eight, haven't found a way to monetize it yet. It's just not one of those hobbies <laughs> that you could do that. <laughs> I got a lot money. of money in that. No, instead I light it on fire every month and, you know, eat a lot of peanut butter, the affordable kind. So, and then I end up sharing it with my horse anyways. So <laughs> whatever. But I would say if, you know, if I could just spend time building out an animal sanctuary or mm-hmm. being a trainer in some capacity that you'd find me probably up in the mountains on a hundred acres doing that and uh, conversing with animals more than people. <laughs> What's Call your... me when you're ready for that. I'll be on board. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> What's your horse's name? I have Nugget. He is my buckskin. He's my gelding. And then I have Atlas. She is my black and white paint mare. And she's actually a rescue horse. My first rescue. Um, I live just a couple miles from a rescue barn. And when I moved to Colorado in 2017, I sold everything back in Connecticut when I moved out and uh, including the truck, the trailer, a couple of my horses and a couple of them I left with a girl I used to board with just to live out their retirement. So I wouldn't have to move them cross country. And I had to essentially start over out here and 
Oh boy, was my dad super thrilled when he got to pass that torch and say, you get to pay for board now and vets and <laughs> shoes and the truck and the trailer. And so I'm very fortunate because my parents still love it as well. And where I board my horses currently is in walking distance to their house. And so on days I can't go over, my dad's over just about every day. You can't keep him away. <laughs> I have the cleanest room at the entire barn because we're neurotic. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is leveled with sand and mats and shaving. <laughs> Things they, I want to come back as those horses in my next life because man, they they have it so good right now. Yes. Um, but I, that's what I would be doing. That's just something that I love, and it, I just I love animals in general. I have two dogs too, and God bless my poor parents. They would love a grandchild, but I keep collecting things with four legs instead. <laughs> so, like, I just got to tell them to keep waiting. <laughs> oh my gosh. Also important vocab point, because I recently learned that a gelding is a male horse or sort of like the bull equivalent of a horse, right? Yes. I okay, can get cool. into the specifics. <laughs> you uh, the, 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 like there's the stallion, which still has all of his his parts yep <laughs> the gelding the gelding oh, yes. has been right little snip snip, snip. <laughs> yep <laughs> little fun fun fact vocab side note um okay so i think did you already think i did not think we were going to be getting into this on today's recording neither I did mean, i <laughs> i y'all knew what you were getting into so this is a, bu this is a bunch of horse shit <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we got two for two on puns. Let's go. <laughs> Between Jimmy and I, the dad jokes will continue to flow. I was I... born and bred on dad jokes. <laughs> I love this so much. Um, okay, so what else do you do for fun? Or I mean, you've already spoken to this a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that obviously takes up a lot of my time. But being in Colorado, I feel like I live in a giant playground. So in the winter, I'm skiing. In the summer, I'm hiking. I love to cook. Again, like I said, if I didn't, we would starve. And so I've just learned to also really love it. And uh, my husband and I love to travel, too. That is something that we always make a priority. Every year, we try to go somewhere unique and different. We are headed out right after Christmas to Europe. And we're doing a whole Nordic trip and doing things like Copenhagen and Amsterdam and going to Finland and way up in the Arctic Circle. And I couldn't find horses up there. So I booked a reindeer farm because that was the next best thing. <laughs> so... Wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be doing that over break. And yeah, so I, I definitely am, am busy. It's another reason why I don't have kids yet. And I, I keep telling my parents that I'm front loading my life a little bit. So just be patient. <laughs> I have a lot to accomplish and get through still. Absolutely. Yeah. One, once kids come, you'll be taking trips to Pennsylvania to go to <laughs> Sesame Place instead of Finland. And... Oh, thanks, Jimmy. You're selling it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> from, it from will Finland happen for you when the time is right. No <laughs> exactly. rush. Exactly. So, and I, my husband always jokes. He's like, well, I'm here when when you're ready. That's right. <laughs> so uh, no pressure. <laughs> Never. And, I, and and make no mistake, I'm sure he's a stallion. Sorry. I'm going to move us along. <laughs> Moment of gratitude. Oh, that would honestly, that would make his day. I can't wait to tell him that one. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, <laughs> Shannon, we love to close out the show with a moment of gratitude. Shout out someone in the industry you admire or perhaps someone on your team. Say something nice about someone who you think might be listening today. Absolutely. I was going to say my, my, my shout out to that gratitude moment from Jimmy. But uh, um, oh, gosh, there are so many people. I mean, obviously, I've already talked extensively about Matt Ackerman. He's always my favorite, but I show him lots of love all the time. But honestly, someone... Uh, who I've known for years and just admire what she's doing right now is Kate Healy. She mm. has always just been a phenomenal resource for me. She's so passionate about her next gen initiative. And I'm so happy to see now that she has launched her, her own thing, her advocate IQ and, oh, mm, brownie points for, for the name alone for her, for her business name. She has just been somebody that has always been incredibly approachable is always willing to help. I always get something out of when I listen to her speak and she just always has a, just a positive attitude of everything. So shout out to, to Kate Healy. I've had a blast just 
watching her come up and now doing her own thing. It's, it's really just fun to see. And I'm super proud of her. And I know I'll be tapping her to, for our future events too. So shout out to Kate. I've had the good fortune to meet her a couple of times. I think it was probably like two wealthy awards dinners in a row where I met her face to face and was able to say hello. But yeah, big fan of all that she does from afar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She is lovely. I actually had a breakthrough meeting with her at Future Proof. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Yes. And that I just wanted, I was always a fan kind of from the rafters. And I was like, I just want to meet you face to face and sit down. And it was so lovely to connect with her. I totally agree. Full support of her new initiative and love to see her out there killing it. Great choice. <laughs> Go, Kate. Awesome. Go, Kate. And go, Shannon. Thank you <laughs> so much for being on the show with us today. I have loved every single minute of it. Are you sure? sure? <laughs> I am sure. I am sure. But I'm also deeply biased considering that we're friends. Full <laughs> disclosure. Um, <laughs> but to our listeners, we hope that you enjoyed hearing Shannon's story and learned something new. Thank you again so much for being on the show. And to everyone who listened in today, be sure to write us via email at pressplay at streetcredpr.com to tell us what you think, ask us any questions, suggest any guests, or even just to tell us what you had for lunch today. Thanks again for tuning in, and we can't wait to introduce you to our next guest. Bye. Thank you for listening to Press Play, the Street Cred Podcast. Visit our website at streetcredpr.com and find us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Please don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. And if you enjoyed the episode, we'd love nothing more than if you would rate and review the show. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Street Cred PR. The content has been made available for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. If you have questions about the show or Street Cred PR, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks again for listening. <laughs> <laughs>